All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Sears. I'm the lean coordinator for the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, and through that work, uh, I got pulled in to uh, the federal ARPA money, as I'm sure many of you have. So the idea being that the federal government has released a lot of money. We have in particular six categories of work that we've been approved to authorize ARPA funding for. And my leadership, <coughs> excuse me, my leadership reached out to me and said we were interested in building an interest form. So the idea of the interest form being um, we wanted to allow people to submit their information to us to know that they were interested in potentially receiving ARPA funds, what types of projects they were interested in funding with that ARPA money, and um, building out our catalog of interested parties so that we can figure out where that allocated money should be going. Uh, in addition to that, I also wanted to build a system that allows us to track that interest for leadership's purposes, so allocating resources, both material and financial, towards the programs that are supporting this ARPA work. So all of this was um, was kind of given to me, and they're like, oh, and by the way, we want it in about three weeks uh, from the moment that I was told. And the programs hadn't been reached out to, and there was no really pre-existing um, content with the exception of some website content, which I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing now. So I'm gonna go ahead and outline the system that I built from um, stem to stern. And then afterwards, um, hopefully we'll have a bunch of questions and I can talk through um, some of the hurdles that I encountered. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we're gonna go ahead and start with the website. So um, there was a pre-existing ARPO website on the Agency of Natural Resources. I um, got editing rights on the website so that I could flush it out. Um, the website's fairly basic as you can see here um, with the six categories of work that we are allowed to spend ARPA funds on, which is reducing sewer overflows, supporting mobile home parks, individual drinking and wastewater, stormwater, pretreatment capacity, and village drinking and wastewater support. So those are the six categories of work. And in talking with each of the programs, I found out that each program kind of had a unique set of information that they were collecting along with a core of information that was pretty consistent across all six programs. So instead of developing a single form using Microsoft Forms like I had originally planned, I decided to go ahead and build six separate forms with the idea of gathering both general information and program specific information. So each of these pages just leads to an information page um, which was provided by each program. They were PDF forms, but they're, it's much more navigable as a website. And each one has a get on the list link, as well as the original site. If you just scroll down, there's a get on the list link. Each one of these get on the list links takes you to a different Microsoft form, one for each of the six programs. There are two sections to each form, one that collects general information. We're gonna talk about what happens with that general information versus what happens with the program specific information in a bit. But at the end of submitting all this information, what happens to the data? So I'm gonna go ahead and show you what the forms look like real quick. Everything uh, is living on a single team site, an ARPA team in this general channel. I was able to build a very simple uh, SharePoint web page to bring it all together. So on this page, it has both the link to that ANR ARPA page as well as um, each of the six individual forms. So if you're a program and you want to see what information has come in, you can click on that form. It'll take you to the form designer. And to gather the data, you can just go to responses, open an Excel and grab a copy of that data for yourself or just look at the responses if you want. So for programs that are gathering this information, that's how they go about that, Justin. Yeah, I just wanted to make one note for people that don't know. So if you see where it says open in Excel, there's a little Excel icon with a cloud next to it. That means that this was developed as somewhat of a group form so that the information does actually live within the cloud versus in some cases when you develop an individual form, the cloud icon will not be there. 
and that information is in kind of a static PDF. I'm sorry, a, a static Excel file. A little bit yeah. more difficult to access. Yeah, and uh, I will discuss why this is this way because um, th that's sort of an interesting development hurdle that I, that I can talk about. Cool. Um, so those are six forms that are all living all in one location, easy for the programs to access the data. So they in particular are interested in their questions in addition to the core information. That core information is flowing via Power Automate into a SharePoint list. That's all it is, is a basic SharePoint list. Um, behind each form, there is a Power Automate script, so it's very easy to um, specify a project type. You can see that I've got, um, it is a drop down type of file here, so um, it colors them very nicely so you can very easily see all the core information that's flowing in project type, contact name, basic information, including um, start date, estimated total project cost, a description of the project, the town the project is happening in, the form submission date, and a identifier that I am developing in the Power Automate script, which I'll show off in a little bit. So why is this information flowing into a central database? Well, one, um, it allows leadership access to a core array of information that has access to the general information they want. Um, this list can be filtered and sorted. It can also be um, edited. So if you have some reason to submit a manual entry or you need to edit the data that's in here, that's easy to do. And we can open it in SharePoint. I'm going to cancel my one selection um, because you can also export to Excel so you can filter and sort and do any additional data analysis you might want to do on this data. Most of the analysis that's currently being done is through Power BI. So I'm on um, the 60 day trial run of the, um, of the Power BI Pro license. So I was able to build this and share it in Teams. Um, and this is all data pulled off of that central database, which is updated once a day from the SharePoint list. Um, I like to use SharePoint list as basically a, a very simple, straightforward database. If all you need is one table, that's all you need to do is build one table. You can do more complicated things in uh, Power BI, but I consider myself a, very much a Power BI novice. I haven't even attended uh, Justin's training on Power BI. So, um, you know, it's entirely off of stuff that I could figure out. Um, so here we basically have a count of the six different project types that have come in via those um, form submissions, a project cost by project type. So we can see that roughly a third of all the um, money that's been allocated has come in through the village. Um, roughly a third of it has been through pretreatment and a little bit of combined sewer overflow, and you can barely even see the on-site amount. But uh, as is typical with Power BI dashboards, mousing over gives you very specific information, which is really, really cool. And it's got all the interactions that you wanna see from a Power BI dashboard. So if I wanna see just what's going on with um, combined sewer overflows, I can go ahead and highlight that. So we can see that this is the amount of money combined sewer overflow, we could go ahead and see highlighted here. Okay, there's a combined sewer overflow project in, there's two of them in Virgins, one in St. Johnsbury, one in St. Albans, one in Hartford, one in Barrie, and so on. So um, it's really, really useful. So this automatically sorts the towns by how many there are. So Brattleboro being the um, most common, next is Colchester, Rockingham, Virgins. Uh, I've got a little sorted list here of project start date, so we can see how many projects when the start of their work begins. And then I'll move Justin over so that you can see um, when the forms are coming in. So we actually launched on the 6th, so right here. Um, we had a couple of submissions that were submitted prior, but um, you can see we had a little peak right after the form launched and the secretary shared this information with the wider public. And you can see we've had a pretty consistent submission over the last um, more than a week. 
this is a really cool component of the dashboard. So each one of the six programs has a certain amount of money set aside for them. So I can sum up that money and see their total progress towards the maximum amount of funding. Combined sewer overflows has $25 million allocated to it with a $10 million in the first year. So we can see that we're roughly two thirds of the way to our $25 million maximum. You can see that villages have already surpassed the $30 million allocated to it. Pre-treatment is more than triple the amount of money allocated to it. And this is all information that leadership can utilize to say, okay, we have way more, we have, we are being asked for way more money than we can actually provide. So it tells us how specific and careful we need to be when choosing who to allocate resources to and the staffing that we need in order to furnish that amount of money. Mobile home parks are approaching their one year limit and on site projects are traditionally um, less expensive than all the other ones. So we're still substantially short of our $1 million one year limit and our $3 million uh, total limit. So we're just going to go ahead and take a quick look at the Power Automate scripts that are behind the scenes running all this stuff. Um, I just want to add, um, so in addition to running the data from the forms to this data dashboard, the Power Automate scripts are also running a bunch of other functions. So the functions that they're running are different for each program, which we can do very easily because we've got six different Power Automate scripts. So some are running receipt emails. So when somebody submits their application, it says, thank you for your submission. Here's more information about this program and more information maybe about the permit navigator, which you can use to determine what permits you might need. So whatever information the program wants to share with the applicant, they can automatically have that generated. Uh, some of the programs are, we're creating um, items in Microsoft Planner. So for each submission that comes in, we're creating items in the interest queue. So ideally each bucket of this represents a process for the mobile home park item. And then when each step gets done and say we're, we start working on MHP 12, we can go ahead and move it over to the processed column and so on down the line. So it's also a great way of reinforcing the project. And this is being done automatically. I'm not, the program's not creating any of these. Uh, in some cases, programs are getting automated emails telling them that submissions are being entered and information from those submissions is populating this. This is all information from the various submissions. All right, let's take a look at those Power Automate scripts. So I mentioned that there are six Power Automate scripts. You can see them here, mobile home parks, on-site, pre-treatment, village, combined sewer overflow, three acre. We can go ahead and take a look at one, which we just looked at the planner for which is the mobile home parks. It's fairly straightforward. So when a new response is submitted, we're gonna go ahead and grab the details. This step right here is the create an item. So this is how it is um, adding an item to that SharePoint list. I'm basically just grabbing the various data fields from the form and dumping them into the table. Uh, creating planner tasks is interesting because you can't just update all the details. You actually have to create the task before you can update it with any of the information. Um, so we create the task right here with a title that I've created. Um, that's the one concatenation field that I'm running right here, which is mobile home park underscore the item number of the submission. So that way it creates unique identifiers for every single item in that list. I haven't used it for much other than um, creating the titles for these, but every good uh, database developer will tell you you need an identifier that's unique. Um, so it creates those tasks and then sends an email. So this particular email is going to two of our program people to tell them that a new task has been created in Project Town by the primary contact email, tells them the type of project that it is with the description of the project and its expected start date. So they're getting the key information they need as soon as it arrives. Some of the other scripts that, I are, that I'm running, it's a little hard to keep track of all six. Um, this one's sending two different emails. So one that's a generic to the primary contact email. 
that says thank you for your submission and some basic information with some key links that the program has identified as vital for the team as well as an email to program staff. Again, telling them the basic information that's coming in on each of these. So that's basically the whole system. It's got a really cool Power BI dashboard. And um, again, all this was developed in less than three weeks. Um, from, from being told the project was beginning to meeting with six different project teams in six different areas in the agency and developing the work. Because once everyone was on board with the basic idea of we're using Microsoft Forms and the data will flow into one place, that's all leadership wanted. And so then it was just a matter of figuring out what the programs needed. So I mentioned that I hit some hiccups with development. So one of those hiccups was I needed to very quickly develop six forms with six different sets of information in them. And I wanted to run Power Automate scripts, but you can't run Power Automate scripts off of forms that are located, that are associated with a team. So what I had to do was I created the six forms myself. Uh, basically, I created one and then created six copies and then modified the program specific information. Then I shared all six of those forms with the team. So that again, that ARPA team. I shared all six forms. And then used that as the collaboration point. I made them all available right here. Um, as a separate tab, so not this. That was why I had to end up creating this, because once they were done collaborating on the forms and they were done making their edits, I had to copy those forms back over to my side so that I could create the Power Automate scripts that run off of those. And then I created this page to allow them all access to edit those forms afterwards. So. That's why um, they're all here instead of just a. Because um, you can do a website and just link them to the teams forms, but you can't do that as easily um, outside of that. And I can't link them to mine. So using this. Real simple SharePoint page. I was able to uh, allow them access to edit those and access. This is the only way they can really access the data. Um, I'm sure Justin could come up with a clever That's, way to pull those ex those Excel files, but well, Sir, Sir Thomas just mentioned this. <laughs> well, wish I had known about this earlier. But so you can actually run Power Automate flows off a team form. It just doesn't show up in the drop down list when you're trying to select it. So you have to actually grab the ID of the form that you've created and manually copy and paste it in, and then you uh -huh. can do all of the stuff from that. Okay, so, would have saved you some time. It, it it wasn't that much more time, right? Because once the forms were done, all I had to do was um, generate yeah. a copy of it and it generated it on mine. So then I was able to just rename that. And all I had to do was, I mean, then I just used those links moving forward. That is a current downside that has bothered me for a long time. <laughs> Anytime I do a group form. So that's the system um, and it's been working really well. You can see um, based on that, dashboard that that's all real data. That's all information that's come in with submissions. So the system seems to be working fine. I hit a couple of hiccups. Um, at one point I had the project descriptions coming into a single line uh, database table, which I hit a character limit, so I had to fix that. Um, so I was able to rebrand that um, that table item as a multi-line or whatever as a multi-line and that cleared up the problem um i had the planner task fail on me on one of the submissions and i figured out the problem was i was assigning it to somebody that didn't exist because uh, i had misspelled the name um, but once i cleared that up it worked fine but other than that everything seems to be working fine and i haven't heard any complaints so any questions yeah, any questions for John about any of that? And I'm happy to go into more detail about any of the stuff that I've shown. They love it, Justin. 
Nice work, John. Um, <clears throat> I guess one of the questions is, um, what are you seeing in terms of like engagement with end users? So are they using uh, everything on a daily basis? Is it more like weekly? Yeah, so um, I anticipated I was going to get that question from leadership, um, which is why one of the data fields in the report is right here. So um, this is project cost and count of ID. So the count is basically the number of forms that have been submitted. Um, so you can see with the blue bar, the volume of forms as they've been submitted. And this is updated uh, once a day. I can't figure out how to get it to update more than once a day. I think the options are once a day or once a week. Um, but I have a last update thing here to let people know when uh, the forms get updated. So that I guess, my, sorry, my, my question is more about like staff or, or staff like engaging with the content that's produced in the planner documents and the emails and, and everything else that's going on. Um, that's a good question. So I don't really know. Um, I suppose I could, so if I head over to the SharePoint, um, I think I can look at site usage. Um, we're seeing a lot of site visits. Uh, is this for the whole team? You can tell I don't go here all that often. I think that's the only way I would really be able to say um, if anyone's using it, I can check out the data and see if anyone's going on that page because that's the page I would expect them to do stuff with, but I don't know if they're actually engaging with the content. Um, largely, this entire setup is meant to, yeah, it's just the whole site. Um, it's meant to cover a gap between people that are hearing about ARPA funds being available and the types of projects that are available and when the actual applications are open um, because most of the applications haven't been developed some of these projects are going to be um, they're going to turn into RFPs or RFIs um, and we're still waiting for those things to be developed um, for at least two of the programs the application is actually already done. I could probably find out if anyone has submitted a form based on that, but I know they're getting the emails because I'm not getting um, a bunch of weird things about the emails. Yeah, so it's always interesting. You know, you, you build these things and you always wonder, is it, what are the outcomes, right? And so that's kind of what I was getting at. Is yeah, it's, it's I don't tough. know. Tough to know. Nice. And. That's one of the reasons that I, again, I didn't spend that much time, like it looks really intricate and really complicated and stuff, but I honestly didn't spend that much time doing it. I only had um, about a week and a half in terms of actual like work time to work on it um, because of the weird uh, deadline and holidays and vacations and stuff. So um, it looks like a lot more than it was. Like to me, it doesn't really even matter if, um, only one or two people use it or if leadership is just looking to see what the volume looks like or if you know down the you know six months down the road people are using the mailing just using the mailing list like that's fine with me because it didn't take me that long to build and a, and a traditional build outside of power platform would have taken how long to get any fraction of that functionality i can't imagine building a database and Using ANR online to to funnel the applications, I, I can't imagine. Yeah, so related to that point about engagement and uh, user activity, there's a podcast which I'll, I'll link called Explicit Measure, Measures. Alex is laughing because I sent it to him a while ago. I'm a data geek, so I listen to these things when I mow the lawn. But there's a uh, there's one episode there where they talk about user engagement, and it's these three guys, they're the Power BI developers, private industry, right? And they're just talking about the fact that 
there's these cases where they build these really complicated dashboards based on requests from the business. And then they look at the user action and they're like, wow, last month one person viewed the dashboard. Like, what the heck's going on here? And so part of it is like, how do we measure the success of a BI team in relation to user engagement? How much time we're investing in what we're building and how many people are actually utilizing the thing that we've built? Great episode on that. Loved it. But I'll, I'll put it in the chat for people that want to geek out on Power BI. Yeah, it, and they talk it, about Power Platform too, but great stuff about like governance and who should own systems, the business or IT and how to do, how to make it tiered. And oh my gosh, it's so good. I, but I can't understate how little time I actually spent on this. What's nice about the the Power Platform stuff is that it all looks so nice and so fancy that it feels like somebody like poured their heart and soul and like months of work into something that honestly, it took me a couple of days. Like it wasn't a huge commitment. And I learned a lot in developing that dashboard. Um, and I feel like I'll be able to take that experience forward. So even if the team was very, well, the individuals asking me to do this work were very unclear about what they wanted. Um, I set about to make a really low overhead, easy to submit, because basically we're just building a mailing list, right? So I didn't want to go overboard with functions or um, or attributes. So I just um, scrapped together what I thought would be the most useful, and that's what I ended up with. All right, so I'll, I'll ask a follow-up question because I've been thinking about this for some things that I'm building. Everything's being run off your account currently, yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. So have you thought about using a service level account to run these run these flows rather than your own, especially for something that's like kind of A&R specific? Yeah, I would really love to. Um, so initially when I was um, generating the auto emails, I so there's there's the outlook to, to send emails and then there's the mail function to send emails and the mail emails come from um, an external reference point. Um, they don't come from internal, but because of that like firewall between internal applications and external applications, I couldn't pass information. So I ended up having to use my own Outlook to send those emails and say like, please do not reply, which I still get replies. It's not a lot and I haven't gotten anything that's like, oh, I gotta let the programs know. Um, but I have gotten some replies and yeah, I'd much rather run this outside of my, because I'm not even really connected to this work. Like they just asked me to build this system because they knew I was good with Microsoft Forms. Um, and it works really, really well, but yeah, I would love to not have it run in my network. And what happens if I move on or um, or my network blows up? Like, I, I don't know how that, um, how that work carries on. It'd be easy enough to export the Power Automate scripts, but you'd also have to move over the forms, and, and I'm not sure how that would work. You're muted, Justin. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, this is a good topic conversation. Alex posted in chat, if anyone from ADS wants to talk about it, that would be great to hear, because I know there's a lot of flows that are being run on user accounts. What's nice about Power Automate is you can share a flow and uh, another person can set it up, you can export it and they can launch it and create their own connections and do it all over again. It's not that much work. So there is that capability there. And I would say most flows should probably be shared with somebody. Just like with a Microsoft team, you typically wanna have at least two owners in place just in case something happens. In terms of the trial account Holly asked about, so for Power BI- um, The data's not going anywhere. The data, correct, yeah. the data is, on SharePoint and everyone can access that data and they can dump it into Excel and they can do whatever they want with it. The uh, trial is only for the Power BI sharing that I'm currently doing. Excellent. Yeah, anyone from ADS wanna just talk briefly about service level accounts? I know we're still working on governance around a lot of this stuff. It's just... So Justin, I'm not, 100% sure on the process for getting one. Um, yeah. That would be Jim's team. Um, but over at AHS, we do have a service account. Um, we run most of our flows underneath it. Um, our understanding is that even if you share a flow with someone else, whoever the original owner is cannot be removed 
and when your account is removed from the tenant, all of that goes away. So with the with what you've built here, John, if you were decide to decide to put in your two weeks and you're gone in two weeks, um, all of this shuts down unless you transfer unless you transfer ownership to either a service account or someone else. So it's looking like the forms are individually owned. Those would go away because those are stored as part of your OneDrive unless they're attached to a team and I missed that. Um, the flows are attached to your account. Those go away um, if they're not on a service account or transferred to someone else. Um, so the flows, um, I have a little bit of experience exporting and importing. So I think that's the way you would go is you would dump them all via the export into those zip files that it has. Then you just bring them in. So basically it'd be like you're creating new flows from scratch. So uh, presumably that would be transitional work if someone was moving on. Um, you'd want to make sure you package up all your flows and put them in a central location so that other people can access them. Whoever ends up doing that work, bringing it in and um, having it run. Because there's a bunch of stuff that I am running that is central support that it has very little to do with me. Um, I'm running some Power Automate stuff that's automating our weekly update report. Um, I, I don't need to run that, but uh, I am. The one caution that I would have with that is this has happened to us a couple times in AHS where someone has left and they've had a bunch of flows that have run underneath their account. And there is no one in the business that has the same level of skill to even do the import. Mm -hmm. And the business does not have someone in that position for several months after it's vacated. So the one thing I would encourage is documenting this up front so that when you do leave, even if there's not an immediate successor, that information is there. Don't wait until your final two weeks to do it because you'll never get it done. <laughs> and then yeah, that's there's a lot of people that advice. end up inheriting that. So, well, I'm not going anywhere just yet, um, but I'll. Oh, we sure. all say that, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good advice. Yeah, documentation important. I tend to for critical flows that I have that are running off my account and I'm I'm moving in the direction of getting a service account because I'm starting to run some agency level flows and I'm like I don't want them on my account I don't want it to be so brittle but I will generally export those flows anytime I make changes to it I export it again as a package and I save that in a folder with all the other files and data related to that particular flow uh, also in terms of best practice I think for stuff like power apps it can be helpful to just take screenshots of uh, the actual user interface for each of the different components and to document off of that screenshot the different formulas that are involved i don't know can if you you've done that for yours can you copy and paste the um the core code like will that generate the same thing i'm not sure on that alex do you have experience with that I'm sorry what was the question just on power apps like how to document power apps yeah, it's tough. I mean, like, honestly, the screenshots are kind of your best, best deal, but it's really painful, right? Because you can expand every single action and it's just a pain in the butt. You can always, and I'd recommend everybody do this, export your Power Automate scripts, right? Keep a copy of those somewhere. So I, I've, I've done this because I recently changed jobs and um, I, I didn't want the burden <laughs> of, uh, you know, when these flows break, you know, someone calls me. So um, I exported all of them and had somebody on the uh, team that was staying, staying there uh, import them, right? So that is, that's kind of how you transition it without a service account, but a service account would be preferable. 